All right, you made it through the first presentation on vector valued functions, and uh, that means you made it through a lot of complicated visualizations. That setup is deliberate because I want you to uh, tackle those as much as possible because the better you can visualize, the better the course will go. But during that presentation, you may have also thought, man, it, it, it would really be nice to have a simple example. And well, straight lines hopefully are that simple example that, that you were wishing for because I don't think we can make it any simpler than a straight line in three dimensions. So let's take a look at this thing. All right, so a straight line is determined by two points. We know that from geometry. Geometry happened in the plane, happened in two dimensions. Um, that statement doesn't change in three dimensions. On the other hand, a straight line is also determined by a point and a slope. Uh, that was also something that we knew in two dimensions. And this idea of slope really is completely connected to two-dimensional space. However, so although the exact idea of a slope is tied to two dimensions, we will start with the idea that a line is determined by a point and a direction, and that direction is going to be a vector. So let's take a look at a line in three-dimensional space or even n-dimensional space, and of course our visualization will remain flat because we've got a flat surface on which I can draw and present things. But that's a straight line, and with a little bit of imagination, you could think that this is something that sits in space, right? How do I determine what that line looks like? Well, here's the line. I would need to find a point on the line, which will have position vector C0. And then I know from that point, if I go straight up or straight back, that's how I reach all the points on the line. So if I now have a direction vector V, and V stands for velocity, uh, if I have this direction vector V, I ought to, by adding multiples of v to this c0 here, I ought to be able to reach every point on this line. And uh, that's exactly the idea for the vector equation of a straight line through the point c0 with direction v. Because that equation is c of t being c0 plus t times v, right? It's the base point, the starting point, plus multiples of the direction or velocity vector. Uh, the domain for the parameter is a set of all real numbers because we want to be able to go forwards as well as backwards, and we don't want to leave any gaps. And, uh, well, once we've got vector equations, there's a mantra that you will see in my presentation, at least, and that is people also often talk about parametric equations, and I'm not going to do that that much because there's only one sentence that to me sums it all up, and that is vector equations and parametric equations are two sides of the same coin. If I have in three dimensions c0 being x0, y0, 0 being my starting point, and my velocity or direction vector being a, b, c, and we're going to, uh, in the presentation on derivatives, we're going to see why that thing is called velocity, but if that vector is a, b, c, then the equation c of t being c0 plus t times v, which is x0, y0, z0 plus t times a, b, c, that equation can also be written as a set of parametric equations, namely x of t, which would be the x co component of c is x0 plus t times a. y of t, you've got three guesses, that's going to be y0 plus t times b. And z of t, you get, well, you don't need to guess there, z of t will be z0, z0 plus t times c. So that can be written as that set of parametric equations. And if I want to go back from the parametric equations to the vector equations, I would just put vector brackets around both sides and then puzzle things apart to get my x0, y0, z0, and my t separate from the ABC. So these two uh, ideas, these two pieces of vocabulary, if you will, really are the same concept. There's no need to separate them in your mind because we can fluently translate between the two and we will do so throughout this course. All right, so if we now have a very simple example that we need to determine the vector equation of the straight line that goes through the points p equals 1, 4, negative 2, and q equals 2, negative 2, 5, well, what are we going to do? We're going to need to find the direction vector v, and that could be either that we start at p and go to q, or that we'd start at q and go to p, I think I want to have it to be q minus p, so we start at p and go to q. So yeah, it's q minus p. The position vectors of these points are, well, the position vector of q is 2, negative 2, 5, right from here. And the position vector of p is 1, 4, negative 2, 1, 4, negative 2 here. 
we do the subtraction, we get 1, negative 6, and 7. Yep, 1, negative 6, and 7. And now c of t is just p, 1, 4, negative 2, plus t times the direction vector 1, negative 6, 7. Now that is now something where we really have that we start at p, and if I add this velocity or direction vector to p, I end up with 2, negative 2, and 5, which is exactly q. Uh, I could have put q in here and I would have gotten the equation of the line also. It would have just had a different parameterization. What does that look like? Well, <clears throat> it looks like this. Here's the point p, here's the point q, and again the vector valued function gives us the trajectory of a point on that line. It just gives us something that travels, right? But what we're interested in in terms of drawing is the trajectory itself, which is drawn over here. Now let's take a quick look and stop right here and we realize that at t equals 0 we're at p just like we I said we would and at t equals 1 well 0.98 but you can see at 1 we're going to be at q so this parameterization really does exactly that and that's where it also then makes sense to call the direction vector a velocity vector because in one time unit we're traversing exactly one length of the velocity vector so that means it really is exactly what a velocity should do. Okay, uh, well what else do we have here? Right, whenever we talk about lines we often also want to talk about line segments. Sometimes we just want to connect an initial point S with a terminal point T. And that can always be parameterized as line segment of U being S plus U times E minus S, which is then often written as 1 minus U times S plus u times e, and you realize that is the same thing because all we're doing is we're multiplying out the parentheses and then sorting terms with s and terms of terms with e, right? We get u times e, that goes right here and everything else has an s, so we get 1s minus u times s, and that's this term that we have here. Um, these two parameterizations certainly are something that are again worth memorizing this one certainly is the more natural one, at least to me it is, maybe it is to most other people also, uh, but this is the one that is often written down simply because it separates the starting point and the ending point. And uh, for that, in order to travel from the starting point to the ending point, of course, we cannot let u run over all real numbers, because if we let u run over all real numbers, we get the whole line. But we know that uh, when u is equal to zero, well, when u is equal to 0, we're at s, and that's where this parameterization comes in very nicely, because plug in u equals 0, you get s. Plug in u equals 1, you get e, so you really go from the starting point to the ending point. So, yeah, if we were to let the parameter range over all real numbers, we would obtain the whole real line, which is not what the intent is when we're looking at a line segment. And a uh, quick proof, well, the equation L of u being 1 minus u s plus u e is just s plus u times e minus s, that is the equation of a straight line with l of u equals s and l of 1 equals e, and that's the whole argument there. Visually, it looks exactly like we expect it to look. We've got a starting point here, we've got an end point here. As long as we're looking at the vector valued function, the point just travels from the start to the end. If we're looking at the trajectory, of course, the function just draws the trajectory that starts at the starting point, ends at the end point, and gives us the line segment. All right, intersections of lines are then another thing where we need to be careful because in three dimensions, of course, we've got an extra dimension that could mess up intersections. So if we're looking at the lines that are parameterized by uh, c1 of t being 3, negative 1, 2, plus t times 4, 1, negative 3, and c2 of t being 1, 3, 0, plus t times 0, 1, 2, well, those two lines um, certainly are not parallel. We're going to define that um, later on, and they're not parallel because their direction vectors are not parallel. I think that that ought to make sense. And so we want to know if these lines intersect and then compute the intersection point if they do. And the way we set that up is we compute intersections, but remember, again, this is the part that I can't flash often enough here. If we set up c1 of t equals c2 of t, we get collision points. We would get uh, the times where the points that traverse the trajectories are in the same position at the same time. Only if we make the parameter for one of the two functions 
a different letter, in this case S, will we get will we also capture the situation that the trajectories can intersect um, at times that are reached by the points that travel the trajectories at, at different times for the two points. Okay, so I've got C1 of T equals C2 of S, and the rest is just computation. This time it really is simple because this is just a system of two e of three equations for two variables, right? We've got 3, negative 1, 2, plus t times 4, 1, negative 3, equals 1, 3, 0, plus s times 0, 1, 2. Now we just read that component-wise. We get 3 plus 4t equals 1 on the right side. We get negative 1 plus t equals 3 plus s. And we get 2 plus negative 3t, so 2 minus 3t equals 2 times s. And now we can start solving these equations. We get t equals negative 1 half from this first equation, because... Uh, 4t is negative 2, and then you divide by 4, right? And then here we get s equals t minus 1 over 3. Uh, whoop, not over 3. <laughs> Goodness gracious, I divide instead of subtract. All right, s equals t minus 4, right, because I subtract the 3. And then, of course, we know that because t is negative 1, we must have that s is negative 9 halves. And here's where we have to be careful, because we've got three equations for two variables. So don't just use this t and this s and compute intersection points. You first have to verify that the third equation is also satisfied. And so 2 minus 3 times negative 1 half, 2 minus 3t, that would be 2 plus 3 halves, that would be 7 halves. And that's not equal to negative 9, which is 2 times negative 9 halves, which is what, what 2s is. And that means the lines do not intersect. And that is something that we can also visualize. I've got that in this MathCAD file here. These are the two lines. I've just plotted them in MathCAD. And we can see if we turn this around, certainly they do not intersect because this line keeps going and this line keeps going. Uh, there are no intersection points outside this box. But what we can also see is these two lines most certainly are not parallel because if I rotate this around like this, um, if the lines were parallel, I could never get a perspective where the picture looks like this, right? Okay, so we have a situation where in three dimensions, lines can not intersect and also not be parallel. That's sort of, well, whenever there's an interesting phenomenon, mathematicians have a definition handy. And so we're saying that two lines, L1 being C1, T equals position 1 plus velocity 1 times T, and L2 being C2 of t equals position 2 plus velocity 2 times t. They're called parallel, if and only if their direction vectors are parallel. Now, we already have talked about, um, about parallel vectors, so this definition should not be a surprise. And if we look at it from a visual point of view, here is an example of two parallel lines. And so here's where I can turn the box, and they are looking parallel. And in fact, if I just change the perspective the right way, I can make those parallel lines sit on top of each other, which is something that I cannot do with lines as in the example that we have just seen and lines as in the example we have just seen, seen namely non-parallel lines that do not intersect. Those things are called skew lines. Okay, so there are two ways to actually represent lines in three dimensions. There's the vector equation, uh, and there are the symmetric equations. Now, some colleagues will say there are three ways to represent lines in three-dimensional space because they count parametric equations separately, and I'm not going to get into an argument there. That is perfectly fine. To me, their uh, parametric equations are just the same as vector equations, or they're two sides of the same coin, but yeah, technically they are different, so that, that is something that we simply uh, can work with. So, what are the symmetric equations of a line? Well, the symmetric equations of a straight line in three-dimensional space are x minus x0 over a equals y minus y0 over b equals z minus z0 over c, where x, y, z is an arbitrary point on the line. And what you can see with these equations is for these equations, it's going to be very quick or very easy to verify that a point is on the line because you just plug in x, y, z and make sure that these equations are satisfied. We're going to see that the symmetric equations really are following from the vector equation uh, or the parametric equations because we're going to do transformations from vector equation to symmetric equations 
and back. So if this right now doesn't quite look like a straight line to you, I don't necessarily blame you. Just give it some time. We're going to see the examples in just a minute. Before we start, however, let's take a note and that is the symmetric equations really are a set of three equations, even though we only have two equal signs, because the equations actually are that x minus x0 over a is y minus y0 over b. Well, we see that here. We must have that y minus y0 over b is z minus z0 over c, which, what we, which is what we have here. And the third equation then is implied. If the first two hold true, then the third one holds true also, but technically there is that third equation, x minus x0 over a equals z minus z0 over c. Okay, so as an example, we want to find the symmetric equations of the line 3, negative 1, 2, plus t times 4, 2, negative 6, and determine which, if any, of the points 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 2, 5, and 5, 0, 3 is on the line. So uh, this is what I said before, that the symmetric equations are very useful to, de to, de to de determine whether a given point is on the line or not. So let's take a look. Okay, so our submit our uh, vector equations can be turned into parametric equations. The x components are 3 plus 4t, y component is negative 1 plus 2t, and the z component is 2 minus 6t. And we can take these equations and solve them for t. So we get t equals, well, bring that over x minus 3 divided by 4. Uh, here you get t equals y plus 1 over 2. And here you get t equals z minus 2 over negative 6, which then is customarily written as 2 minus z over 6. And that means because t, of course, is the parameter for that point, we must have that x minus 3 over 4 is equal to y plus 1 over 2, which must be equal to 2 minus z over 6. So actually, the conversion from symmet from um, vector equations to symmetric equations is you solve for t. That's the only thing that you need to keep in mind there aside from the form of the equations. If we're now going to use the symmetric equations, and these are just the equations from the previous panel, well we look at the point 1, 1, 1, and we plug it in and we realize 1 minus 3 over 4 is negative 1 half, which is not the same as 1 plus 1 over 2, which is 1. That means that this point is not on the line. We're looking at the point 1, negative 2, 5. Well, 1 minus 3 over 4 is still 1 half. Negative 2 plus 1 over 2 is also negative 1 half. Ah, uh, yeah, I should have said negative 1 half here. And uh, 2 minus 5 over 6 is also negative 1 half. And that means this point is on the line. Finally, the point, point 5, 0, 3. Well, we've got that 5 minus 3 over 4. That is plus 1 half this time around. And that's the same as 0 plus 1 over 2, because that's 1 half also. But we've got to check all equations, and we see here that the last one, 2 minus 3 over 6, that's negative 1 6, and that's not equal to 1 half. And so that means this point is not on the line. So also here, as you verify symmetric equations, you've got to verify it all. If only one of them fails, things are problematic, and the point is not on the line. OK, and uh, yeah. Right, what does it look like? Well, here's the, here's the line. Let's see, um, it has, it's coming forwards in x, it's coming up in y, but it's, it's going down in z, and the point then simply is, well, here's one point, here's another point, and uh, so here's, here's the point 1, 1, 1, whoops. Here's the point 1, negative 2, 5, that one is right, and Here's the point 5, 0, and 3. Yeah, you can see how perspective really can play, really can play quite, quite a number on you here. Because, let's see, right, the point 1, 1, 1, because x equals 1 is here, that really is the point 1, 1, 1, 5, 0, 3 is here, and that one is there. Yeah, that is something where basically what you want to do as if, actually, when the two-dimensional images don't help anymore. You really want to plot this in a computer algebra system and then rotate the cube around. I can't do that here because I can't embed the, the stuff that can rotate into, um, into PDFs. All right, so we move on. And we also want to, of course, be able to translate back from the symmetric equations to the vector equation. And the way we do that is we realize 
that as we have the symmetric equation, okay, here's x minus 5 over 3, 6 minus y over, 6 minus y is just 6 minus y over 1, or y minus 6 over negative 1, so we just fit the pattern of what the definition of the symmetric equation says, and then we've got 2 minus 3z, here's where we have to be careful, because z is supposed to be on its own, so we end up with this being, uh, let's see, 3 halves, uh, let's just work it out. That's z minus two-thirds over negative one-third. Yeah, and that's because I factor out a negative three that gives me the z minus two-thirds, and the negative three in the denominator becomes a negative one-third. Right. All right, so this is what the uh, symmetric equations look like if we turn them into the form that is given in the definition, and once we've got that, we realize that five, six, and two-thirds has to be a point on the line because x equals 5, y equals 6, and z equals 2 thirds satisfies the equations. And remember when we solve for t, we always divide by the factor that is given by the velocity slash direction vector. And that means that our direction is 3, negative 1, negative 1 third. And that means the vector equation is 5, 6, 2 thirds plus t times 3, negative 1, 1 third. And uh, yeah, that's already it. Now, what you will see as you hit the homework on this section is that you'll have homework problems that ask you to determine whether, something, whether two lines are parallel. Well, we haven't seen an example on that, but how hard can it be? You compare the direction vectors, and if they are parallel to each other, we're fine, and if not, the lines are not parallel. So lines and then the corresponding connection with planes, and often these two are lumped together even though they are not in, in these presentations. That is one of the places in the course where we can make do with very few fundamental definitions, and once we've got these fundamental definitions, we can do a lot more than we can present examples for. So the main thing here is to firmly understand those fundamental definitions, and then go ahead and tackle whatever problems are being thrown at you. Okay. We're going to get more formal. We're actually going to get back to doing calculus because we're going to start talking about limits now. And that's the next presentation, of course. Uh, you probably want to take a break before then.